and they don't go through any of that, um, any of the process there to learn it or master that. And in my opinion, if you can't sell, you can't be in business. <laughs> so, um, especially if you're starting out, you know, from you, it's just you and another couple of people or you yourself, you're kind of starting as a solopreneur and growing from there. Mm. It's, you there's it's really really difficult to get around that because even if you say oh i don't have to sell i'll just hire that out and you have a ton of money to invest you're still not going to know the ins and outs of your customer base and so you won't be able to make good decisions uh and there's no in my opinion more efficient way to to learn that than just to do that face to face or over the phone with people or just one-to-one you know human connections and human relationships yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's that definitely is a, a roadblock that a lot of people have to get over because even if it doesn't look like you're in sales, chances are you probably are you know, on some level. You know, even mm-hmm. even if it's a yep. coaching direct or whatever. I mean, you're you're either selling a product or service or you're selling yourself. And so you're selling something. Yeah. And it's just a matter of, you know, coming to terms with it, you know, own it, embrace it, and you know, use it. <clears throat> What are, no, what are some definitely, of the definitely a huge roadblock? What are some of the support and resources uh, that you've discovered uh, that that people should be looking for to help them succeed? Um, I, I always recommend that people like actually just hang around the people that are doing what they want to do. So, if you're getting into coaching and consulting, you should pay a coach or consultant to mentor you, you know, or watch what they do at least, you know, pay for people's time so that you're serious about it. And so the other person can actually help you. Um, We talked earlier about kind of like the differences of, you know, Europe or, or the old world in our, and the States, you know, one thing that's, I wish we did more of is like more apprenticeships um, and more processes like that, because that actually shows you what goes on a day to day basis. So, I highly encourage people to find somebody that can mentor them and show them the ropes and kind of guide them along the way. And, you know, you can pay for that or you can go work for free somewhere or you can go work for an entry level, you know, pay or whatever, and you can learn a ton. Um, The the people that you're around are going to have the biggest impact on how you view the world and what you do. And so the other way that I do that a lot still, um, because I'm, you know, been in business for 20 years and, and a little bit farther down the road. But the other way that I do that on a continual basis is, you know, read books and listen, you know, listen to audiobooks, listen to podcasts and kind of pay attention to what other people have done. Cause some of those podcast episodes or books have ended up leading to my next big business idea just by kind of observing what somebody else did. So that's the way that you can virtually hang out with your mentors, but you absolutely need to have people that are going to influence you and teach you and show you the right direction. Yeah, and I love the the mentor mention that you you put in there because you know that that is something that that is so so valuable. You know, as the saying goes, we're we're the sum of the parts of the five or six people we surround ourselves with. So if yeah. those five or six people are you know further down the road than where we are, and they they have what we want, they've achieved what we want to achieve, then it's only natural that at some point that's going to rub off on us, and we're going to pick it up. It's almost by osmosis, it, it seems sometimes that it, it, you just become those that you're around. And, yeah. and so it's valuable, valuable to think about, you know, who are you spending your time with and are they productive people or are they toxic people? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with, with your business, uh, is that something that you've, you've been able to inject your, your personal value system into uh, with your business? Now, a lot of people are doing that nowadays, uh, maybe more than, than used to. So is that something that you've been able to put your values into what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, every two or three years, I, I we actually just finished doing this a couple of weeks ago, but every two or three years we go through and kind of review our core values and what our mission statement is um, and what, you know, what we believe and what we're about. And, you know, as the founder, I get to, you know, influence that, you know, greatly, obviously. And so, Things like being responsive, you know, being on time, you know, being, you know, completing things on time, um, going the extra mile to, you know, serve our customers and help them and help them find solutions um, and being creative about how we, you know, find solutions and solve problems. I mean, those are all things that that we find are important. Um, And so that's a part of our kind of day to day operations. It's how we onboard 
people and filter them out actually, if they're not responsive or not somebody that would fit with our culture. Um, but it's definitely something that we spend a lot of time, you know, talking about, thinking about and teaching and preaching about internally with our, with our team so that that, you know, is ultimately how we communicate and how we treat our customers. But yeah, it's, um, that's something that I didn't always think about early on. Like when I first started, I just purely thought about, here's the product, how am I going to sell it? And I'll just figure out how to deliver it or, you know, you know, what needs to happen to, to complete the process. I wasn't as intentional about the culture or the folks that I wanted on my team or even the clients that we want to work with that are our client partners. Um, and so now it's definitely something I think a lot about it because it makes a huge impact on everything, the relationships you have, how much you enjoy what you do, you know, working wise, um, profitability. I mean, it's, 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 to think through that stuff because otherwise you just go where the money is and that's not necessarily what you should do. Yep. For sure. For sure. Um, so what's something that maybe you wish you would have done earlier in life that you did not do that you've since discovered what was important? Um, for me, I wish I would have spent more time on like financial management, like budgeting and, you know, financial controls and CFO modeling and things like that. Because for me, I always had the answer. I'm like, Oh, I can just sell more. Like, I don't have to worry about, you know, if there's not enough money, I'll just go sell more work. Um, and so sales has always been something that I've been good at for quite a long time. Um, and practice, I practice all the time to this day, but you know, the, the old saying, like you, you can fill a, a bucket with holes in the bottom as much as you want. It's never going to hold water. Um, and when you, when you budget correctly and when you have, you know, you know, financial models and like, you know, basically CFO type controls or, or financial controller models inside your business, then you actually have stability and you can grow and scale infinitely. When you just wing it with throwing more money into the machine and you don't know how the machine works, then you're going to get capped at a certain level. You may figure it out a little bit or you may have massive problems or whatever. It's just not in your control and then you're, you're in a really bad spot. So that's something if I would have done years ago, I would have a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd have a lot more impact and I'd have a lot, you know, things, things would be a lot easier. So that's something I, that now, now that we do, it's, it works phenomenally well, but that's something I really encourage people starting out to focus on is figure out sales, figure out your product, get things up and running, but make sure that you're also implementing, you know, financial controls in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, certainly some good nuggets there. Certainly some really good nuggets. Uh, when, when you were, uh, Basically, uh, transitioning into the entrepreneurship uh, realm, uh, obviously, you, you had some hurdles that you had to overcome, uh, maybe even on a personal level, uh, personal hurdles, maybe with family or, or what have you. How did you overcome that? Um, for, for me, I started out as an entrepreneur when I was 16. So if it, it's not quite like you know a lot of people that maybe worked a day job and then you know moved over into entrepreneurship or did something. Um, you know, different after that, but I more had like hurdles after I got into it. For me, I've always had the, the tenacity to just go try new things. I mean, I've started a couple dozen companies and been involved in, you know, many other ones and it's always been entertaining to me. So, um, it is pretty common and I've had this too personally where people don't get what you're doing or they don't support you or have no clue even how to talk to you about what you're doing as an entrepreneur because it's really foreign to them. So that's, that's pretty common, but from a starting out standpoint, um, I always just went out and sold some, sold what I wanted to do and then figured out how to do it on the back end. So the, you know, I, I generally speaking, always pre-sold my ideas. So it's not been as difficult as like going to raise money first or going to build a prototype first or doing things like that. That's not the path that I've taken. Okay. So, uh, maybe if you can kind of talk me through uh, that process and, and how that worked. Yeah. So, um, four years ago, we launched what's now a, a million dollar product, um, called copywriter today. And I realized that people would build a website or they'd say, Oh, I want to do email marketing or they want to, you know, do social you know, media or things like that. They would have these great ideas and they'd, they'd start up or get their site up or get their mobile app launched or what, or, you know, get email marketing software. And then within a matter of weeks or months or even, you know, days, sometimes, you would go back and they had completely stalled out because they didn't have any content to, you know, share with their audience. They didn't have the time or interest to write 
another blog post or update their services page or write a case study or send a press release or whatever from a content perspective. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, this seems like something that I can solve. And most people charge, you know, hundreds, you know, up to hundreds of dollars for, or even thousands of dollars for written content. And I said, well, that doesn't work for most small and medium sized businesses. So I said, if I create a subscription where you can get, you know, X number of articles per month to keep your blog full and your email marketing and um, all that handled, would that work? So instead of doing a full launch and a big, you know, figure out how it works. All I did was build a checkout page and reached out to people on LinkedIn and called some people. And I think we had 10 customers in the first week. I then built out the back end to deliver the process. I wrote all the content myself for the first three months. And then I hired writers and managers and built it all out from there. So rather than hiring a bunch of people, wasting a bunch of time and money, if it wouldn't have worked, I just sold it first and delivered it after I sold it. And that's, that's the way I launch almost everything. Um, and I've even like pre-sold stuff at even more of a discount and said, Hey, this is what we're launching. If you buy in now, then we'll be delivering this in 30 days or whatever it is. And then the, the full process will start. And if we don't deliver it, I'll just give you your money back. Um, and that protects everybody involved, but it also validates the idea because you're actually getting paid for something that people want an opinion of like, Oh, that sounds like a great idea. When you start it, I'll check it out. That's not valid. The difference right, right. If, if somebody says, Oh yeah, I want to do that. I'll give you the hundred bucks now or whatever, whatever the money is. If the, you exchange any money, it's a valid idea. Yeah. Good tip, sir. And it, it's, it's very, uh, very counter, I, I think to how a lot of people look at business and, you know, they, they struggle because they're, they're going through the other approach, you know, trying to, you know, do all the develop the R and D, you know, try to get everything done in the, in the upfront then to come up with a product and then discover, okay, well, there's really not a market for it. That's how everybody does it. That's yep. the wrong way. <laughs> and it's very expensive and emotionally damaging. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. So uh, is there uh, maybe another profession out there that, you know, besides the, the things that you've done that, that you've toyed with wanting to do that, that you haven't done yet? Um, I try a lot of things that I want to try because that's the, the benefit of being an entrepreneur. You can have some flexibility to do that stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm getting more and more. I'm getting into like coaching and consulting, which I like. Um, so that's something that I've been branching out to instead of just straight, you know, business services or whatever. But other than that, I don't have a good answer for that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what would you say your greatest strength is? Uh, like a, a character quality that's your greatest strength? Um, pro probably my ability to persist and keep trying things until I find something that works. Um, I've noticed a lot over the last few years, especially, that I'll partner up with people and start working on projects, and you know, three, four weeks, or three, four months, or a year or two in, they're kind of not around anymore even if we're still trying to figure it out or make it work. Um, and so that's kind of a pattern that I've seen where for me, it's not hard to keep trying until I figure it out. Um, cause I know what the alternative looks like and I don't, I don't like that. So I'm more than willing to, to work hard and, and be persistent and stick with it. Um, and then on top of that, probably like my creativity and my ability to walk into a company or talk to somebody and figure out the missing piece for them very quickly. Um, that's something that I do a lot of and it's effective and, and a lot of fun. And then operationally, I, that strength has grown a lot for me because building enough systems and processes and breaking things down, you know, you start to figure out what works, what doesn't work and how processes flow and how to basically make your business a, a manufacturing plan for yourself. So. Good, good. Uh, and yeah, you know, obviously the, there's the opposite edge to that question. Um, what's your greatest weakness then? Would you say? Would you say? Um, I I like learning new things so much that it's easy to get distracted when I'm in the middle of something. So if I something pops up and it's like, oh, here's a new feature, or here's something new that's rolling out, or this is new technology that's coming out, I I can pretty easily get distracted and learn about that stuff. It and it ends up paying me later down the road because I know about it then, but I have to watch that I don't get, I don't rabbit trail too fast. 
Yeah, as we, we call it on the 